and then we can do a little quick review of what we were talking about last time. Okay, so we are talking about momentum. And momentum is defined as mass times velocity. And in particular, we were focused mostly on collisions. And so hopefully you had a chance to do the collisions lab. And uh, we're really only doing collisions in one dimension in this unit, in this class. So that means um, our objects are sort of restricted to just move forward or backward. But when they hit each other, they can't bounce off at an angle like on a pool table. If you want to see how that works, you can go to the, the latter part of the lab simulation and you can play around with um, two-dimensional collisions. But for us, in collisions, we will have P final equals P initial. And that means the total momentum before the collision is equal to the total momentum after the collision. Typically, we've got, we're talking about two objects sliding. So this would look like M1, V1 final plus M2, V2 final equals M1, V1 initial plus M2, V2 initial. And the, philosophically, what we're thinking about is imagining we know what's going on before the collision and we know the mass is, and then we're going to compute the final velocities. But it could just as easily work in reverse. That is, we might know all the final stuff, and we want to predict, you know, not into the future, but in the past, what was going on. So this would be what um, a forensic scientist would do, looking at a car crash and trying to figure out, you know, who hit whom and how fast they were going and that kind of stuff. So we can work forward or backwards, but either way, we typically have two unknowns, um, the V1 final and V2 final, or possibly V1 initial and V2 initial instead. So um, in order to solve one equation with two unknowns, we need to find a new equation. And so that's why we, we split the problems into two categories. So we're not splitting this equation, we're splitting into two categories of collision, elastic and inelastic. And you will recall that elastic means, you know, the word in English means something can be deformed and returned to its original shape. But in physics, it just means that the kinetic energy is conserved. So we would say Ke final equals Ke initial. And for inelastic, that's still very broad. And so we split it into totally inelastic problems, which are very easy because they just have V1 final equals V2 final. These two underlined in green, V1 final, V2 final, those two variables are not really two variables. They're really just one variable. And we don't really need another equation, or you can think of this as the simplest of all possible second equations. And then there's partially inelastic. And for these, we don't really have another equation. And so we just need some more information somehow. And generally, we won't see these in our problems unless maybe an eyewitness tells us V1 final equals something, and then now find V2 final. So then they still become easy. We'll focus our energy on these two guys. And last time we saw that for the elastic collisions, the math to, you know, if we write this out as an equation, one half m1 v1 final squared plus all this stuff, big ugly equation. The math is, is really tricky. And so we derived a new equation V1 initial minus V2 initial equals negative V1 final minus V2 final. So this equation, which basically 
says that the relative velocity is conserved. Hopefully you saw that happening in the lab. Relative velocity is conserved before and after elastic collisions, whereas the relative velocity in a totally inelastic collision, since V1 final equals V2 final, this thing gives me zero. So if really totally inelastic equations are the worst possible example of trying to conserve relative velocity. And um, as you get more and more elastic, you get closer and closer to obeying this relationship. Hopefully the lab made that clear, but that's really just important from a conceptual standpoint. We won't really do problems that are partially inelastic. Okay, so that's basically where we were. We are going to be focused on, you know, two types of problems, elastic and totally inelastic. And then we're going to kind of see how we can combine that physics with some other physics uh, later on today. Any questions about that overview? Does that kind of, you know, ring a bell, remind you of what you, what we did last time? I'm going to take that, that you're all nodding your head. Okay, so let's just get warmed up by doing a practice problem. Okay, so suppose we have an object and it has a mass of 10 kilograms and an initial velocity of, um, let's say, 5 meters per second, and it's going to hit a second stationary mass of three kilograms. So this would be V1 initial there, and this would be V2 initial, and it's stationary. And it's an elastic collision, so we're gonna find V1 final and V2 final, and something new, the percent of kinetic energy transferred from M1 to M2. So we have the first one I'll call M1, and the second one we'll call M2. Okay, so that's it. We're going to do what we did last class and find the final velocities, but at the end we're adding another question. How much of the kinetic energy that's initially only in mass 1, how much of that transfers to mass 2 in terms of the percentage? So first things first, I'm going to start with my conservation of momentum equation. M1, V1 final, plus M2, V2 final. Please don't think of this as a new equation to memorize. This is just final momentum equals initial momentum. And you should think of it that way because that's what's really happening and that's what's going to help you understand what you're doing. And also helps you not have to memorize equations or get nervous that you won't have the right equation. Um, so, so there it is, conservation momentum. Um, I typically like to go ahead and put in numbers for masses in these problems. So we're gonna have 10 times V1 final plus three times V2 final equals 10 times uh, just five and because this guy's at rest, V2 initial zero, I can just cross that out. So we have 15 V1 final plus 3 V2 final equals 50. Okay, so that's one equation with two unknowns, and we need a second equation. So because it is elastic, and this is very important that we only use this equation for elastic collisions. But because it's elastic, we can use V1 initial minus V2 initial equals minus the quantity V1 final minus V2 final. And again, this is a little bit easier example because V2 initial is zero, so I can just cross that out. We have five on the left-hand side equals V2 final minus V1 final. So I'm distributing the minus sign through here. Why do I have the minus sign there? Well, just because it makes this equation have a meaning, a deeper meaning that says the relative velocity 
is conserved except for the minus sign. And then I can now solve it for either V2 final or V1 final. I tend to find I like to solve for V2 final because then I, when I move V1 final to the other side, everything positive. But it doesn't matter. And once I have made that substitution equation, I can actually substitute. So we're going to have, let's see, that's 10, right? So 10 V1 final plus 3 times the quantity 5 plus V1 final equals 50. And distributing, this is going to give me a 3 V1 final plus the 10 gives me a 13 V1 final plus 15 equals 50, so 13 V1 final equals 35, just subtracting 15 from both sides, and one final would be 35 over 13. So that's not a very nice round number, but let's go ahead and get a decimal approximation. That would be 2.69. meters per second. And then that leads us to V2 final, which is just 5 plus V1 final, and that would be then 7.69. Okay, so um, that gives us our final answer any questions about that for the first part finding the final velocities Haley. um why instead of just saying like m1 v initial plus m2 v2 initial why do we have the inequality sign uh say that again why do we have what is that like a is not equals to sign no, there's no inequality sign. Where are you looking? At the very, very beginning when we first do the momentum. Is that just supposed to be a plus? Yeah, that's a plus. Okay, I, that was my question. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right, other questions? Okay, so we have the velocities, and now we want to find the percentage of kinetic energy transferred from M1 to M2. So how would we write that what are we looking for so we want to know essentially the the ratio of the kinetic energy uh, that mass one loses so that would be k e1 final or i guess sorry i should it's how much it loses so in english that would be the initial minus the final so that's how much however much it loses is how much it transfers, and that would be over Ke1 initial. So that's the energy lost over the whole energy, and that's what's transferred. We could also write it as the kinetic energy that um, you know that mass two gets, which would be the its final minus its initial, so um, over the initial kinetic energy of mass one. Either way, what's on top should be the same number. So it just depends how you think of it. If you think of it as how much does mass one lose, you take initial minus final so that you have the bigger number first. If you're thinking how much does mass two gain, you do final minus initial because again, you want the bigger number first, okay? doesn't really matter, um, but I like to think of it in this first way because I can simplify this to give me, um, you know, if I split the fractions up, Ke1 initial, Ke1 initial gives me just a 1 uh, minus Ke1 final over Ke1 initial. So that's 1 minus 
the kinetic energy one final will be one half m1 v1 final squared and kinetic energy one initial is one half m1 v1 initial squared and so also by keeping it all in terms of mass one then you know the masses cancel those one halves cancel and we get something pretty simple to compute so one minus my v1 final if we go back and look my v1 final is 2.69 so that's 2.69 squared over my initial speed, which was five. And what I get is 0 0.71. So this would be 71%. Transferred. I think there's only I think there's only one R in transfer. But maybe there's two. See, this is why my handwriting is bad. If I write it messily, then no one can tell if I spelled it incorrectly. Anyone know? Is there one R or two in transfer? Ziad? It's Lars. It's two? You sure? Okay. Yeah. Well, there. I've got two. Okay. Good. So, um, so there we go. That's how we find how much energy is transferred. Any questions about that? Okay. Let's try a totally inelastic problem. In this case, We'll do something similar, but we will be asking how much energy is lost instead of transferred. So um, let's do the same two masses. M1 equals 10 kilograms. V1 initial equals five meters per second. And it hits a stationary M2, which is three kilograms with a V2 initial that is zero, but it's totally in elastic. We're gonna find the final and percentage of energy lost. So we start in the same place, M1, V1 final plus M2, V2 final equals, so they all start here, M1, V1 initial plus M2, V2 initial, because hopefully in the lab you saw that the momentum is conserved no matter what. Even though the uh, kinetic energy is only conserved in elastic, momentum is always conserved. And we know that the two final velocities will be the same because it's totally inelastic. In other words, they're going to crash and then they're going to move with just some V final together as one. So we can just factor out the M1 and M2 times V final because those two Vs are both the same. The right hand side doesn't change. And so then V final is M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial over M1 plus M2. So putting my numbers in, we have 10 times 5 plus, you know, 3 times 0. Probably could have crossed this out, you know, earlier. Save myself a little bit of digital ink, and we divide that by 10 plus 3, so that's 50 over 13. And that is 3.85 meters per second. 
Okay. So think for yourself, before I write this down, just to think for yourself, how would you express the percentage of kinetic energy lost for the whole system? What would you do the kinetic energy amount lost for the whole system? It's going to be a ratio, something over the initial kinetic energy of the system. Anyone want to give it a shot? What do you think goes on top? No takers, Monday. Um, so we're just going to take the initial kinetic energy minus the final kinetic energy. But this is system-wide. This is for the whole system now. So on the top, that gives us how much is lost. That would be an absolute number of joules that are lost. But we want to divide that by however much energy we started with. So in other words, if we started with 1,000 joules and we lost 100 joules, so the top would be 100 joules, the bottom would be 1,000. When we do that ratio, we get a percentage. Okay, so um, this is going to be one half m1 b1 initial squared because all of the kinetic energy is in mass one minus one half. We can think of the final kinetic energy as one big blob of 13 kilograms times v final squared. So one half times the total mass times B final squared over one half M1, the initial squared. So in the same way, this is gonna be equal to one minus, so the first part gives me a one, one minus the quantity one half times M1 plus M2, B final squared over one half M1, the initial squared. And so not too much cancels here, but I can get rid of the one half. We're gonna have one minus 13 times 3.85 squared over 10 times five squared. I get 0 0.23 meters, not meters per second. There's no units here, just 0 0.23, which would be 23%. Okay, any questions about this problem? Okay, so um, so you guys should practice a little bit your uh, inelastic, totally inelastic, and your elastic collisions, including sometimes, you know, finding the energy, amount of energy transferred or the energy lost, uh, depending on whether it's elastic or inelastic. But there are some other types of examples other than, um, other than collisions and also other than just simple collisions, whereas what I mean is there are problems where there's a collision involved, but there's more physics going on, more things after the collision. So we're going to try some of those as well. Uh, but let's first do a recoil problem. Okay, so recoil is a phenomenon that occurs when you have basically a system that separates. So we saw this uh, yesterday, not yesterday, but last lecture, I guess that would be Thursday last week, when we had an asteroid and we blew it up with an explosive and one piece went one way and the other piece went the other. Uh, we also 
hear about recoil when we fire a gun or something like that. Um, so let's let's do a, a gun problem. Suppose we have um, you know a rifle and you know there's you know, there's a, a bullet up here and we're gonna fire the rifle and when we do the bullet is going to emerge at some speed okay so um, we could say um, that the final speed of the bullet let's say that is 300 meters per second and we want to find the final speed of the rifle in that situation so the rifle is going to kick back when the bullet moves forward um, suppose the mass of the rifle is 10 kilograms and the mass of the bullet is only 15 grams or 0 0.015 kilograms. So the, the relationship, the, the rule of physics that governs this is that initially the momentum is zero for the system and so the final momentum which is equal to the initial momentum must also be zero. So we're going to have m bullet v bullet final plus m rifle v rifle final equals zero and we just rearrange this to solve for the V I guess I, I called that uh, FB and FR so let me keep be say consistent there FB and FR we want to solve for the VFR so mass of the rifle VFR equals negative mass of the bullet VF bullet and BFR is minus uh, mass of the bullet, B final for the bullet over mass of the rifle. I mean, I'm sorry, this is making me sleepy. So I'm, I'm probably making you sleepy. I apologize. Um, we'll take a we'll take a break in not so soon, but kind of soon. So the mass of the bullet is 0 0.015 kilograms and the final velocity of the bullet is 300 meters per second and we're dividing by 10 kilograms it's a pretty heavy rifle let's see what we get So we're going to get B final for the rifle is negative 0 0.45 meters per second. Okay, any, uh, any questions about that? Stephanie. Um, can you explain again why P initial is zero? Oh, usually, I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be zero, but normally I'm, I'm imagining a person firing the gun is not moving, so the gun is not moving initially. But I guess if you're like in an action movie, if you're really like running while you fire, then, um, then you would have initial velocity for both of those. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. We would say that the initial velocity, um, the initial for the rifle equals zero, the initial for the bullet equals zero. But let's say you were running 10 meters per second and then you fire this, so these would both be 10. Then what would happen is you would then say the bullet is going 310 meters per second forward and then you would subtract this 0.45 from the 10 meters of the rifle, 10 meters per second. And so it, basically, even if you're moving, you can kind of just calculate from the frame of reference of the rifle. Does that make sense?
Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, and that's generally going to be the case for the recoil type of problems. It could be maybe someone standing on a, a boat and the boat's at rest in the water and then they jump at a certain speed and the boat goes the other way. Um, okay, other questions? So, yeah. Just under P initial equals zero, is that P final minus P initial or are they both, are you saying they're both equal to zero? Uh, each other it equals really this is what we have p final equals p initial but you know i just while i was talking i kind of said and that's equal to zero but we don't probably need to keep that there we can just go down p initial equals zero and p final is that stuff okay awesome thank you sure. mm -hmm. great other questions All right, um, let's do, do one more problem and uh, then we'll take, a, we'll take a break. So this problem is kind of a, a popular example in physics books and physics labs. Um, this is my favorite lab when we're in person to do. It's called the ballistic pendulum. And the idea is you um, you have something that shoots a, a project, you know, projectile, like a gun shooting a bullet. Um, we have a little spring-loaded thing that shoots a, a kind of a big metal ball. Um, and it doesn't matter what you're shooting. But you want to know the velocity of the object that you're shooting. And this is a technique that's, that's used for measuring the, the velocity that a bullet kind of comes out of a, a gun barrel. Um, if you think about trying to find this initial speed of a bullet using the physics that, you know, before this chapter, it would actually be pretty hard. If you, let's say you have a gun. Um, does anyone here have a gun? Raise your hand if you own a gun. Nobody owns a gun? I don't have a gun either. But, um, you know, if, if you had a gun and you wanted to know how fast do the bullets come out, what you could do using the physics that we know is you could go someplace, you know, some kind of tall building and fire the bullet horizontally and um, then, you know, see where the bullet lands and use our kinematic master equations. Now that presents a couple of problems. Um, from a physics standpoint, there's a lot of air resistance on a bullet. And we always ignore air resistance, but we saw in our projectile motion lab that when you turn air resistance on, you know, it, it can make a difference. And what, what we didn't explore in that is that the faster the object moves, the more air resistance there is. Um, but for something like a bullet, there's a lot of air resistance. So, you know, that would be, the physics would be there are technical problems such as trying to find the bullet. It would not be so easy to find the bullet that you shot unless you're a really good shot. And then there are legal problems because the SWAT team is going to show up if you try to do this and they're going to, well, they're probably going to shoot you. So anyway, you can't really do this. So what can you do? You take your bullet and you fire it. And so we're going to say it has an initial velocity. And you fire it into a block of wood. The block of wood is hanging from the ceiling. And when the bullet gets lodged in the block of wood, what's going to happen is the block of wood is going to swing up to some angle um, and some height and if we can measure how high the block of wood goes we're going to learn that we can work backward and predict the initial velocity of the bullet so how does it work well we need um, some numbers so maybe we have the mass of the bullet and the mass of the wood. mass of the bullet let's take the same bullet 15 grams and um, the mass of the wood 
is, let's say it's two kilograms. And suppose we fire this and we see that it goes up a distance of 15 centimeters, which would be 0 0.15 meters. And we want to work backward from that to determining the initial velocity of the bullet. So how does it work? Well, this is a collision. Can anyone tell me what kind of collision it is? Ziad. If it's a pendulum, should it be elastic? That's, a, that's close. Anyone else have a different guess? You know elastic is wrong and you don't have another guess? No one wants to, there's two choices. There's partially inelastic or totally inelastic. Anyone think it's totally inelastic? Raise your hand. Hmm. Okay, so, um, hmm. Okay, let's talk about collisions for a minute. We have two kinds, elastic and inelastic. And elastic collisions conserve energy, and inelastic collisions lose energy. So um, what's an example of an elastic collision if we drop a super ball? The super ball deforms, returns to its original shape, and it's going to rebound with a lot of kinetic energy. What's an example of a not a very elastic collision? Um, an egg would be a good inelastic collision. When I throw an egg at the wall, it does not deform and then rebound and keep its shape and fly away with the same velocity. Instead, it breaks and it sticks to the wall. Okay, so sticking to the wall means that's a totally inelastic collision because the wall and the egg, those are my two objects, their final velocities are the same. But even if, you know, I throw something that doesn't stick to the wall, if that object changes its shape, like let's say it's a ball of clay or something, I throw it at the wall and it kind of smushes, but it falls off. The smushing requires a loss of energy. If the object is changed in any way, it costs you energy to make that change. So when I see a problem like this, um, and, and I see that the block of wood is changed after the collision, then I know that this is an inelastic collision because damage done translates to energy lost. Okay, that's a good way to think about it. Any damage that's done means there's energy loss. If you see a car crash and the cars are damaged, then that was an inelastic collision. Whether it's totally inelastic or partially inelastic depends on do they stick together. So um, in this case, the bullet sticks in the block of wood. So this would be totally inelastic. Okay because it, it sticks, so their final velocities are the same. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, um, so yeah, so, so that's totally inelastic. Well, we know totally inelastic collisions lose kinetic energy, so what I cannot do, this is what I can't do. Don't even write this down. I'm just showing you what I cannot do, and then I'm going to erase it. I cannot say, you know, that the initial kinetic energy of the bullet becomes changed into the, um, the potential energy of the wood. This would be Ke initial equals Pe final. Cannot do that because I know that this is an inelastic collision and it's not true that if I have a thousand joules of kinetic energy at the beginning, 
I will get a thousand joules of potential energy at the end. So I cannot do that. Okay, cannot do it. But here's what I can do. I can split the problem into two parts. And the first part is the collision. And the second part I'm going to call the swing. The part after the collision has occurred when the block and bullet together swing upward. Now during the collision, we would say that the final momentum equals the initial momentum. That's true for all collisions. During the swing, we would say that the um, initial kinetic energy becomes transformed into the final potential energy. In other words, energy is conserved in the swinging part. So after we fire the bullet, it lodges in the block and maybe it loses 90% of its energy, but once it's lost that energy, now whatever's left is in the form of kinetic energy and we, we call that the initial kinetic energy of the swing phase and that's going to be 100% converted into the potential energy in the swing phase. So the bullet's still in the block. So we do this in stages. The initial momentum would just be, or the final momentum is going to be mass of the bullet plus mass of the wood times V final. And the initial momentum is only the bullet. And so our V initial is going to be M bullet plus M wood V final over and bullet. So what's the final velocity after the collision? Well, the final velocity here becomes the initial velocity of the swing phase. Whatever's the final velocity of the collision becomes the initial velocity of the swing phase. So for the swing, this is just one big mass. So we have one half mv plus m wood times the initial squared, and that's equal to m bullet plus m wood times g times h. And the whole mass stuff, that just cancels out anyway because it's the same on both sides. And we could say that squared is 2 times g times h, or the initial equals the square root of 2 times g times h. Now, remember, the initial velocity of the swing phase is the same as the final velocity of the collision phase, so we can bring that back and substitute it. The initial would therefore be M plus M wood over MB times the square root of 2GH. So what do we get? The initial would be mass of the bullet, which is 0 0.015 plus and it's frozen plus the mass of the wood, which is 2, over mass of the bullet again, 0 0.015, and then times the square root of 2 times 9.8 times my height, which is 0 0.15. And you know, we have to be careful about units, make sure everything's in meters, everything's in kilograms, and so forth. And I get 230 meters per second. 
Okay, so that's how a ballistic pendulum works. And we have a few problems like this. Um, the key here is it is a collision, but because it is totally inelastic, we cannot think of energy being conserved during the collision. However, after the collision, energy becomes conserved again. So if we were to compute the initial kinetic energy of the bullet alone using this velocity, and the final kinetic energy of bullet plus block, we'll see that you know a lot of energy was lost. But by using conservation of energy only for the second phase, we can connect the, the maximum height achieved with the initial velocity of the swing, which in turn is the final velocity of the collision. Okay, any questions? All right, um, let's take a, a break. Maybe, I think we need seven minutes today. I think we need a seven minute break. So seven minutes, see you in a few. <laughs>